Now take your Bible and open it, please, to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We're speaking on this subject. What is God really like? What is God really like? Are getting to know God. Now let me say at the outset, this is important to you because your conception of God will determine your conduct. I mean, for example, if you don't believe there's a God, if you think that you are the orphan of the apes, then you'll spend your time making a monkey out of yourself. But if you believe that you were created by the hand of an omnipotent God and that Jesus Christ is his son, then you're going to find out that the highest ambition in life is to be like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So your conception of God and your knowledge of God is very important. It's going to determine your conduct. Now, the 139th Psalm is a description of God. It tells us four things about God. There are 24 chapters, and each six chapters tell us a part of what we need to know about God. Four equal divisions. I want you to read with me the first six verses. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. And what do those verses tell us about God? They tell us that there is nothing that God does not know. There is nothing that God does not know. God knows all about you. Notice verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Now you can fool your pastor and you can fool your wife and you can fool your parents, but mister, you can't fool God. There's a difference in your character and your reputation. Your reputation is what others think about you. Your character is what God knows about you. And God knows your heart right now. God knows all about you. The Bible makes it plain that God knows your thoughts. Look in verse 2, the last part. Thou understandest my thought afar off. There is one mind reader, and that mind reader is God. God knows your very thoughts. God knows what you're thinking right now as you sit in church. God knows whether you're listening to the sermon. God knows whether your mind is a thousand miles away. God can read your mind. God knows your thoughts. I heard of a little girl one day who received a toy stethoscope for present, and she valued it because she could play nurse with it or doctor with it, but her daddy took it put it in his ears and put it up on her forehead and said, oh, with this I can tell what you're thinking. She said, you cannot. What am I thinking? He said, you were thinking you wanted some of that ice cream mama just put in the refrigerator. Well, that's exactly what she was thinking. Now, the father was wise because he'd watched the little girl's eyes as she'd seen her mother put the ice cream in the refrigerator and it wasn't a very hard prediction for him, but to her it was astounding. Do you know what happened to that stethoscope? It was hidden. They couldn't find it anymore. Nothing like that around that house. No siree. And of course, many of us, if we had a window on our hearts, would want a stained glass window, wouldn't we? We would not want people to be able to read our mind and to read our thoughts. But I tell you, my dear friend, that God knows your thoughts. And this is the reason you'd better keep your thoughts clean. For Jesus said, whosoever lusteth after a woman hath committed adultery with her in his heart. God knows it. When you have hate, God says that's murder. And God knows your thoughts. God knows your thoughts. But not only does God know your thoughts, God knows your actions and your deeds. Notice verse 2, Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Notice verse 3, Thou compassest my path and, and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. There's nothing you do but what God sees it and God records it. And God's candid camera is grinding away. There's an all-seeing eye watching you, my dear friend. There's a spy in the sky and don't forget it. God sees what you do. I mean, young man, he knows those things done in secret. Those things that people think that nobody else has ever seen, God knows all. He knows your thoughts, he knows your deeds, and furthermore, he knows your words. He hears everything you say. Notice verse 4. 
There's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Many things are opened by mistake, but none so frequently as the mouth. Many times we say things that we ought not to say. And the Bible says that every idle word that men speak shall they give account thereof in the day of judgment. We would be amazed if we knew how much we speak. Did you know that in a lifetime of conversation 50 years, it has been estimated that men speak a library of 1,200 books of 300 pages each? What a library of conversation. Think of it. God is keeping a record of this. Some poet has said, if all that we say in a single day with never a word left out were printed each night in clear black and white, would prove queer reading, no doubt. And then just suppose, ere one's eyes he could close, he must read the day's record through. Then wouldn't one sigh and wouldn't one try a great deal less talking to do. And I more than half think that many a kink would be smooth in life's tangled thread if one half that we say in a single day were forever left unsaid. Now God knows your Words. Every time you take his name in vain, God knows it. Every time you dip your tongue in the slime of slander and assassinate somebody's character, God knows it. Every time you tell a dirty, filthy joke, God knows it. God records your words. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that God doesn't know. Oh, my dear friend, this ought to remind you that one of these days you're going to face him at the judgment. This ought to remind you that sin cannot get by. But what a comfort it ought to be also to the child of God that he understands. He knows your thoughts. Many times we're misunderstood, aren't we? But God knows. He knows. The second thing I want you to notice about God, not only is there nothing that God does not know, but secondly, there is no place where God is not. There is no place where God is not. Notice the next six verses. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. How absurd, my dear friend, to run from God. You can't run from God. You can't get away from God. This is the reason people are so silly not to surrender to Jesus Christ. I guarantee you by the authority of the Word of God that you're going to meet Jesus Christ. He is inescapable. He is unavoidable. He is inevitable. You, go, you have a date with deity. There's no way that you can get away. You're going to meet the Lord. Why not meet Him in mercy? Why not meet Him in, in forgiveness? Why not meet Him in salvation rather than meeting Him in hell and retribution? Listen, He says, If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. Could you ascend higher into the heights than ever a Saturn rocket has gone? Almighty God would be there. And it would be silly to go to heaven to get away from God anyway, wouldn't it? That would be like flying to the center of the sun to get away from its heat. Dear friend, you can't get away from God by going to heaven. If I ascend to heaven, behold, thou art there. And furthermore, if you don't love God, you wouldn't love heaven. Did you know that? He's there. Oh, but he goes on to say, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Is it a revelation to you to know that God is in hell? My dear friend, there's no place that God is not. He's not suffering in hell, but he's the Lord of hell. Let me tell you something. We've got a mistaken, erroneous idea that somehow the devil is the lord of the dark domain. He is not. The devil is not the lord of hell going around in a pair of long red underwear with a fork sticking people and making them shovel coal. That doesn't come out of the Bible. Drinking liquid flames for cocktails and all the rest of that. Laughing and gleeing and snorting and breathing fire. That doesn't come out of the Bible. The Bible says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels and it is a place of suffering. And do you know who the Lord of hell is? The same Lord of heaven. One Lord. Did you know something? Let me tell you something. The Bible says God hath exalted his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, watch it, and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I tell you, my dear friend, one of these days you're going to bow that knee to Jesus Christ. One of these days you're going to bow your knee to Jesus Christ as I live, saith the Lord. Every knee shall bow to me. That's a promise. God takes an oath by Himself. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. You're going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. If you ascend to heaven, He's there. If you bore down to hell, He's there. Oh, furthermore, if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, He's there. The wings of the morning, what does that refer to? In Palestine, when the sun comes up, for just a few moments in the early morning, there's some white fleecy clouds off in the east. The wings of the morning. About 7 o'clock, those wings are folded, but they're there. He's thinking of the rising sun, the sunlight playing upon the clouds as the wings of the morning. The uttermost part of the sea is way across the Mediterranean where no stranger at this time would ever dare to dream that he could, could travel. But what is the psalmist saying? He's saying, if I could hijack a cloud and fly at the speed of light 186,000 miles per second across the Mediterranean to get away from God, if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost part of the sea, when I get off my cloud, God will say, hello. <laughs> He's there. He's there. There's no place where God is not. An unbeliever went to the board in the classroom and wrote, God is nowhere. A young lady said, I can fix that and move the W. And it said, God is now here. God is now here. There is no place where God is not. And then, notice, he goes on to say that even the darkness cannot hide you from God. Notice in God's blessed word. It, 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 in verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. The night and the light are the same to God. God doesn't need, God doesn't need light to see you, dear friend. God can see. We're afraid of the dark sometimes, and sometimes we think that we hide in the dark, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But God doesn't need that light to see. God has simply given you the darkness to, to uh, arrest your mortal eyes. But God sees through the darkness. God sees every deed done in the darkness. I spoke about character a little while ago. Let me give you another definition of character. Character is what a man is in the dark. When the lights go out, Put a, a room full of junior boys and girls in a building and they'll be behaving pretty nicely, but let the lights go out. Just let the lights go out. And what's in those juniors will come out, right? Well, listen, God sees in the darkness. Oh, we say teacher can't see, mama can't see, preacher can't see, the policeman can't see. But oh, God sees and even the night around you is lightness. A little girl was told to go up to her bedroom one night. She was frightened. The mother said, sweetheart, that's all right. Go up there. She said, Mama, turn on the light. She said, you don't need the light. God's up there. The little girl went up the creaking stairs. The window curtain ruffled a little bit. The clothes there on the chair looked like some sort of a bear in the darkness about to grab her. She prayed, oh God, if you're up here, don't move. You'll scare me to death. Now, this is the way that many people are so far as the darkness is concerned. But let me tell you, dear friend, the darkness cannot hide from God. Even the light and the night are the same to Him. And what is the psalmist saying? He knows all about me. That's what he's saying in the first six verses. He is omniscient, if you want a big word for it. Secondly, he's everywhere. There's no place that I can get away from him. He is omnipresent, if you want a big word for it. And then the third thing that the psalmist says about the Lord, not only does he know everything, and not only is he every place, but the third thing that the psalmist says about the Lord is he can do anything. Would you start and look here in verse 12, uh, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. And then he goes on to describe how the little embryo grows in its mother's womb. Now, the thought here, the key is in verse 14. Will you look at it? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. Now, what's he saying? He's saying God can do anything. 
And as he, he uses as an illustration of the fact that God can do anything the miracle of human reproduction. Marvelous are thy works. Not only, God, do you know everything. Not only are you everywhere. But, God, you can do anything. And that's illustrated by the fact that God created man and God makes man able to reproduce himself. You know, people say, Brother Rogers, do you believe in the virgin birth? Of course I do. Well, they say, isn't it kind of hard to believe that a, a woman could have a child without an earthly father? Remember that woman asked us that question in Switzerland. Remember, she said, Mr. Rogers, you're a married man. You actually believe in the virgin birth? I said, of course I do. She asked us that when we were witnessing to her in Switzerland. Let me tell you something, dear friend. If you find it hard to believe that Jesus Christ was born of an earthly mother and a heavenly father and no earthly father, let me tell you something. Adam, the first man, didn't have a father or a mother. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> huh? Sure. Oh, listen, you talk about miracle. There's the miracle of the natural birth. That's a miracle. There's the miracle of the virgin birth. That's a miracle. And there's the miracle of the new birth. That's an amazing birth too, isn't it? And this is what the psalmist is saying. He's saying God can do anything, anything. And he illustrates it by his own body. He says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, some people are not as impressed with human beings as others. A little girl wrote an essay about people, and this is what she said. People are composed of girls and boys, also men and women. Boys are no good at all until they grow up and get married. Men who don't get married are no good either. Boys are an awful bother. They want everything they see except soap. My mom is a woman and my daddy is a man. A woman is a grown-up girl with children. My daddy is such a nice man, I think he must have been a girl when he was a boy. <laughs> now, this is what she thought of people. But the psalmist looks at himself. He looks at his fingers. He, he beholds other people. He thinks of how he was formed in his mother's womb. He, he thinks of, of how fantastic it all is. And he says, I'm, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me just tell you something about that little organ that you call a heart. Listen, dear friend, that heart beats 100,000 times every day. 40 million times a year. Two billion times in a lifetime and never once does it shut down for repairs. Two billion times. Did you know in your lifetime your heart will pump enough blood to fill a skyscraper the size of the Empire State Building? Your heart. Did you know that? Do you know how many miles of blood vessels there are in your body? Get hold of your seat. 100,000 miles of blood vessels in one human body. 100,000 miles of blood vessels in one body. The psalmist says, God, you can do anything. My dear friend, if God made you, he is omnipotent. Do you have a problem? There are no problems God cannot solve. Do you have a sin? There are no sins God cannot forgive. Do you have a hunger? There's no hunger God cannot satisfy. Do you, dear friend, want to be saved? There's no sinner God cannot save. I'm the Lord thy God. Is there anything too hard for me? We serve a great God. Did you know that? Oh, listen, too many people have too low a conception of God. If you want a big word for it, He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is omnipotent. But then I want you to notice the last thing the psalmist says about this God is that he is holy. God cannot overlook sin. We've talked about the things that God cannot do and the things God can do. But my dear friend, there's nothing God cannot do except this, overlook sin. And this does not mean that he is not omnipotent, but it means that he's holy. There is no sin that God will overlook. Notice in verse, starting in verse 19, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do, I, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. My friend, there is no sin that God will overlook. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked. Do you know what the message of this book is, among other things? God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be sure your sin will find you out. The soul that sinneth it will surely die. Surely thou shalt slay the wicked. Dear friend, do you think any sinner is going to get away with his sin because of the lack of evidence when God was watching when it was done? When God knew his thoughts, God knew his deeds, God saw in the darkness, he committed the crime in the face of the judge. You can't plead I was framed. You can't say there was no lack of evidence. I tell you, my dear friend, one of these days you're going to face your sin. One of these days, unless you're saved, you're going to face your sin. Every sin you've ever done has been recorded with a pen of iron and rocks of lead and letters of flame. One of these days at the judgment, the books are going to be open. You're going to face the books. You're going to face the record. Surely thou shalt slay the wicked. Therefore, what does the psalmist say? He says, depart from me, ye bloody man. I hate them that hate God with a perfect hatred. Now notice this, a perfect hatred. What kind of hatred is a perfect hatred? It is a holy indignation against sin. Oh, sure, there's the compassion for the lost sinner, but that's not what he's talking about here, not at all. He's not saying he doesn't want these people to come to Christ. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, I am taking my stand 100% against wrong that nailed Jesus to the cross. I am taking a stand. I'm choosing sides against wrong. Have you chosen sides against wrong? Have you? Are you an enemy to the enemies of God? And are you a friend to the friends of Jesus? Or have you tried to sit on the fence? May God have mercy upon your weak soul if you have. There's some people here in this congregation who haven't got the grace to serve God nor the courage to serve the devil. Poor, pitiful souls. Why don't you stand up? If God is God, serve Him. If He's not, forget all about it. Why do you play church? May God give us that perfect hatred of sin and that holy love for the Lord Jesus Christ. May His enemies be our enemies, His friends our friends. I say, if God is such a great God and if He's holy, it's time to choose sides. Amen? Amen. It's time to choose sides. Let those people where you work know whose side you're on. Don't be ashamed to be a soldier of the cross. Secondly, it's time to be judgment day honest. Now let's put away our little games. The psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there be some wicked way in me. You know, it's easy to go through form and ritual, isn't it? You know, sometimes people go to church and they say, oh, well, he didn't hit me. (laughs) You know, he didn't preach to me today. One pastor had a man needed preaching to so bad he tried to do it in every service. You know what the man told him when he met him at the door? He said, Pastor, you really gave it to him today. One day, this fellow was the only man who came to church. The pastor unloaded. Do you know what he said at the door? He said, Pastor, if they'd have been here, you'd have really told them today. Oh, listen, we often think, you know, that it's not me, but it's them standing in the need of prayer. But what does the psalmist say? Search me, O God. Search me. It's me. It's me. It's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And when the invitation is given today, don't you lift your head and look around and see if some of those old sinners are going to give their hearts to Jesus. I dare you, pray this prayer. Search me, O God. Search me, O God. Put the white hot light of thy searchlight of holiness upon my sin. The dark corners of my imagination. Search me, O God. I say it's time to take sides. It's time to be honest. And it's time to choose the right way. He says, and lead me in the way everlasting. And what way is that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the New Testament answer to that Old Testament prayer. Search me 
and then lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus said, I'm the way. Without me, there's no going. I'm the truth. Without me, there's no knowing. I'm the life. Without me, there's no growing. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way everlasting. Now be honest with me. Have you been saved? Are you born again? Someone asked Mel Trotter how he knew he was saved. You know what his answer was? He said, I ought to know I was there when it happened. <laughs> Were you there when it happened? Huh? Was there a time when you realized that there's nothing God doesn't know? There's no place where God is not. There's nothing that God cannot do. And that God will not overlook sin. Have you cast yourself upon Jesus? The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul though all hell should endeavor to shake. I will never, no never, no never forsake. Let us pray.